From the University of California's California China Climate Institute, this is Climate Dialogues with Jerry Brown. In Episode 9, Institute Chair Jerry Brown speaks with Dr. Liz Hadley of Stanford's Department of Biology. Hadley is expert in organismal biology and ecological systems. The pair discuss the scientific consensus on climate change and climate's biodiversity implications, including species loss and the risks climate presents for humans and natural ecosystems alike. Listen to their conversation now. Liz, uh, welcome to our podcast here. Uh, spon- Thank you. Sponsored by the uh, California China. Climate Institute at the University of California. Um, and not that that's in contradistinction to all that Stanford's doing, uh, but I would just say good that UC and Stanford and other universities in California and the world are grappling with this large uh, global challenge. And that, uh, that's what I want to talk about. And I want to start with your experience. Um, well, first time I might say that uh, you put together a statement in 2012, uh, a consensus statement of scientists uh, warning people about the, the, the threats we face. So maybe we could start there because that was the first time we worked together. And that's almost, uh, almost going on 10 years. Right. And so uh, what, kind of tell me how, what that statement was all about and and we'll talk about where, where we are now. Well, we've written a paper um, that was published in a high profile science, uh, you know, na- nature article. And we, you happen to see coverage of that, I believe in the San Francisco Chronicle. And you called the lead author up, Tony Barnowski, and you asked him, what's, you know, what's this I read about this emergency? And uh, how come we don't know more about it? And we said, well, gosh, we thought we'd been screaming it from the rooftops this whole time. And so we started a dialogue and you said, you gave us, this was a really major educational experience for me because you said, you need to write it in a, in a way that people understand. And if you do it, then you need to get a lot of other scientists that agree with you. So just have them sign on and I'll spread it around. And we went off and we did our thing and we wrote this consensus statement and it basically said that the world is coming close to this uh, tipping point in our ability to handle not only our own future, but the future of the planet. And it had to do with climate, had to do with biodiversity loss, had to do with overconsumption of resources and our co-option of land and water, um, pollution, toxins. And that all these things were kind of coming together to create a gigantic catastrophe for the planet. And that before we really got too far, we needed to come up with a a set of uh, agreed and carefully crafted ways of going forward as uh, humanity, as people, as a planet. And we got, you know, very quickly, we had many, many people sign on within, I think it was two weeks, less than two weeks, we had thousands of people sign on from all around the world. And then we gave this to you, this consensus statement, and you jointly uh, released it. And as I understand, you gave it to many leaders around the world. I did. That summar- summarized it about right? Yeah, that, that did. And uh, again, if we compare the magnitude of the problem as you describe it, and as they believe it to be, and the response of humanity, of political leaders, I see a, tr- a huge gap between the seriousness, the magnitude of the problem, and the political response. So, on the list of 20 things that politicians talk about, this is not number one yet. And yet, in some way, it is number one. It is. Wouldn't you say? It's number one. It's at the root of, you know, it's at the root of everything that we're seeing right now transpire in California and the West and the whole continent in the world, it's at the base. And we've always had struggles for resources and for water as the, 
you know, get warmer and drier as the climates change. We've always had rains in one place and droughts in another, but this kind of dramatic shifting in, there's a, so much more energy in our atmospheric and oceanic system. And the only way to equilibrate that energy based on our humans, you know, contribution to global warming, the only way to equilibrate it is to, you know, is to basically move these currents of air and water faster through land and sea. And what that does is it sets up extraordinary gradients that make these issues emergencies when they arise. They're faster, you know, fires in the American West have doubled in frequency. They've increased in extent and uh, they're much more intense than they ever used to be. Totally. I don't know how many total acres we burned this year in California, but the a million, energy. A million and a half before. So let me ask you, you said that the energy has to speed up. Is that because the uh, impact of human beings, the fossil fuels, the methane, the, the CO2, all this going into the air, uh, this impact? That's speeding up. I, I didn't it's quite follow that. Up. It's heating up the world and the atmosphere. And right yeah. now, most of our heat is is the way the Earth works. Most of the heat is concentrated around the equator. And so, in order to equilibrate heat, just like you know, water flows from high to low, heat goes from hot to cold. There's a it has to be an equilibration. And so, as that equilibration proceeds from the equator toward the poles, you get these dramatic fluctuations in. Uh, differences in temperature and that gradient causes a vast amount of energy and currents between both oceans and uh, the atmosphere. When you're heating up the oceans, that creates more, in some places, way more water coming down as rain because the water is evaporating easier. I mean, I don't need to go into the details of climate, but the point is that it's completely expected that these intense interactions, these intense events in la on land and sea are to be expected as we go through this massive climate change. And this is all caused by uh, human activity? It's caused by human activity. It's, it's caused by our burning of fossil fuels. It's caused by, it's actually now we're, you know, our own forest fires. It's become a big circular loop, right? Our forest fires are contributing to this too. We have fewer sinks or fewer places that that carbon goes to stay out of the atmosphere in land and sea because of our actions. So we're releasing more into the atmosphere and it's a big feedback loop. Well, kind of comparing the way California was for 10,000 years before the European, European settlers got here, uh, the, the estimates are there are only never more than 300,000. And maybe there are a few more, a few less, but that was a 10,000 year period that uh, as far as we know, things were relatively stable. Now, starting, well, uh, Father Sarah got here 1769 and things really speeded up at the gold rush, 1848, and things really got going uh, after World War II. And now we're 40 million people, 25 million or 30 million cars going uh, 240 billion miles a year, uh, consuming, 18 billion gallons of gasoline, uh, so uh, gasoline and diesel. So this is quite a change from what it was for 10,000 years. And, and so th this is what this uh, replicated all over the world, or most of the world. That's that's why we're in the mess. So you bet the we've replaced wild animal biodiversity with humans and with our commensal animals. So cows and horses and pigs and dogs and cats. And, and they take up, we, we have way increased the biomass that planet, the planet would normally support, the, supported for uh, millions of years. And the reason is because we're supplementing the energy the, you know, basically most of the life on the planet without human interference and drawing from fossil fuels just depends on mostly photosynthesis. And what we're, what we're doing is we're adding to that with fuels that were you know, stored in the Earth's crust from the Cretaceous. So 60 million years ago, 65 million years ago, or 100 million years ago, we're taking that, those you know, buried forests and we're consuming them to create more of us, more of our animals, 
more things for us to build and live with and do things with. And that's fueling, that's releasing a ton of carbon to the atmosphere. I think another, so you've heard of the Anthropocene, right? Yeah, I, I've heard that term, yes, many times. So, so you know, we could, we could debate about whether or not it's a formal term or not, but really the inflection point of, you know, they're basically, the inflection point is around the middle of, around 1950. And, you know, there's definitely the Industrial Revolution that happened before that. There's definitely, you know, we've had a, a role to play in agriculture and in, in domestication of stock for thousands of years. But, you know, the big difference is that we lived in what's called the Holocene. Humans evolved around 200,000 years ago. And then our domestication of our, our, our plants and animals and the settling in these urban areas, which suburban areas or little villages really happened around 2,000 years ago, so plus or minus, depending on where you are, maybe 4,000 years ago. And so that period of time known as the Holocene, which is the last 11,000 years, was so constant in climate. I mean, sure, there were fluctuations. There was something called the medieval warm period. There was something called the middle uh, Holocene climatic optimum. There was the little ice age. So there were fluctuations in climate that were a little warmer, a little cooler. And plants and animals responded to that, as did we. But for the most part, our sea, sea levels were constant. We had a relatively constant environment. And the best way to describe it is that we planted the crops that grew best last year for the following year. And now the biggest change is that we can't rely on what happened yesterday to make predictions about what's going to happen tomorrow. Our cities are, you know, where we live, how we live, what we, you know, everything we've done to create our connections between people and nature, all of those things have eroded and they're now no longer dependent upon thousands of years of coevolution and, you know, the ecological development and synergy between us and, and, and nature, those kinds of things are eroding. And in terms of thinking about, the best way of thinking about the Anthropocene it, for me is, you know, we humans evolved in the midst of nature, surrounded by nature, embedded in nature. And now nature is completely surrounded and embedded in humanity. And that flip is a very, we're no longer held and, and kind of encompassed by nature the only nature that lives is the nature that we have we have somehow kept intact or kept from our influence. And that is less and less every year. And that nature though, the biological rules, the physical laws are still functioning. Absolutely. So that's where we get the negative feedback. Absolutely. So, you know, life depends on energy. And as I said, most life on the planet until we kind of came around is dependent mostly almost 100% on photosynthetic energy. And we're co-opting most of that photosynthetic energy for ourselves or for our animals. And then we're supplementing that. So there's a very simple and really profound, I don't know why it's not used more, but I'd love to see it used in agriculture in California, actually. Um, that's a very simple relationship that can explain all the vegetation structure in the world. It's based on two simple variables. One is temperature and the other is precipitation. So if you take your x-axis and you look at your mean annual temperature and you take y-axis and it's looking at the mean annual precipitation, water and temperature, you can predict based on those two factors, if you're in a tundra, if you're in a grassland, a shrubland, a temperate rainforest, a tropical rainforest, basically trees take a lot of water. Why are we planting and still planting trees where the, the, the vegetation before we got there and started irrigating was grasslands. So I can tell you just by looking at this figure that where we have trees now, we have to, and we used to have grasslands, we have to augment that with a lot of water that we bring in from somewhere else. So why not have some sort of, you know, our ability to understand nature, even at this structural level, we just violate all those rules. And it's even something as simple as don't plant trees where they can't grow naturally is an incredibly powerful way to guide well, our own food. Okay, when you say plant trees, are you talking about uh, orchard trees? Any uh, tree. 
Yeah. But, but are we play, are we playing fir tree? What about timber? Is that going? That's not going with grasslands, is it? Timber. Uh, yes, that's a really interesting question. Here's here's what I would say to that, and that is that in California, the equilibrial vegetation structure that we have right now, that we imagine where our forest boundaries are, where our grassland boundaries are, where the chaparral is, all of that is in transition. Our vegetation is out of equilibrium with the present climate now. Today, the climate now, not even the climate of the future, these forests are burning. They're going to burn. These forests are going to die because they're going to just die from drought or temperature being overheated. They're gonna die from pathogens of some sort, even native pathogens like beetles or some disease like sudden oak death or some other kind of you know, rust disease, or they're going to be attacked by insects, or they are going to uh, be outcompeted by a, a better competitor, many of which are non-native, or they're gonna burn. And what's gonna happen, what's gonna replace a lot of those forests, shrublands, and grasslands that we have, eventually it will reach a new equilibrium and a new vegetation because we are so out of whack in terms of our vegetation with, with what now, we now look, yeah, We're out of whack because of our uh, commercial uh, orchards? And no, no, I'm not talking because about of the our trees. Farm. I'm talking well, about just our native, just our, our native vegetation, our vegetation zones without even adding forest, I mean, uh, farmlands to it um, or orchards to it. I'm talking, you're talking about, about like San Francisco and Palo Alto downtown. Or the Sierra the Mountains. I'm talking about the grasslands in the Central Valley, those few that haven't been turned to agriculture. All of our, you know, our, you know, our uh, native California habitats are shifting because of climate. Right. And this, they will continue to shift because climate has changed dramatically in our state and around the world. So, okay, so uh, the, the, you, you wrote a book called Limits to Growth, uh, uh, published in 1972, made quite a stir, sold millions of copies. Then people trashed it and said, well, we have a lot of oil, we have a lot of copper, not a problem. But the basic message of that book was that there's a carrying capacity to the earth, uh, that human beings have an impact or a footprint, and that footprint has to be uh, limited or we get all sorts of destructive consequences. Uh, how, uh, how do you explain, you're talking now about vegetation and the overload of suburbs and the way we've taken our grasslands and planted uh, various kinds of... Uh, no, I, I'm just simply talking uh, about the because the climate change around the world, because of climate change, that we have already, we have already pushed our climates so far that our present, you know, native vegetation, the vegetation that was here in the 1800s when your grandfather settled, um, that vegetation is now no longer suited for the climates of today regardless of where we're building our cities or plowing under grasslands to plant trees or whatever, our present native vegetation has, is basically out of equilibrium with the climates of today. And so what is going to happen is those are going to shift. How does that happen? How do you have a biome shift? How do you shift from a forest to a grassland or forest to a shrubland? You generally go from that kind of, how do you do that? Well, what we're seeing is because of this energetic change and this dramatic warming in, in the case of California and drying out of our lands, what we're seeing is a very rapid, almost violent shift. And those shifts are coming in the form of disease and fires. And just, stay. I remember talking to you about the number of trees, millions of trees that were standing dead in the Sierras. Part of that is due to drought. Part of that was due to insects. And now a lot of it's due to fires. And, you know, it's not just our, you know, that we're not burning forests the way, you know, the First Nations people did. It's not just that we haven't cleared or they haven't burned in so long that we haven't cleared the understory. These trees are going to burn. It's just a matter of when. And the reason is because they are out there. You can't grow redwood trees in Palo Alto anymore. 
it's just they're drying out. They're, they're, there's not enough moisture. Well, where, so, where I'm sitting right now, uh, and I look out the window, oak trees. Yeah. Uh, mostly yeah. a blue oak for the most yeah, part. Yeah, blue oak, little, gorgeous. Little, yep. Little, little valley oak too. A uh, little bit of manzanita. Yep. But the oak, as you move up 100, 200 feet, uh, almost all the leaves are gone. These trees are, uh, you know, they're sucking moisture out of the ground the best they can get it. But I presume if we keep getting dry years, that these oak trees could die. Exactly. And we're lucky in California because we have such a diversity of oaks. The blue oaks are having a tough time. They have a very, do you know blue oaks have, have the best tree ring record of any tree? They're the platinum tree ring record. So we have an extraordinary record that goes back about 1,200 years in the Central Valley near where you live. That's all from blue oak. It's beautiful. Um, and we're, yeah, we're, we're doing some work on, on looking at that at, at Jasper Ridge. But, but I'll tell you, we are so lucky because we have a plethora of oak species. And what's likely to happen as long as we give them a way to do it, is that there will be other oaks that are more southerly adapted, adapted to more extreme temperatures, warmer temperatures, and more extreme, particularly drought. And those oaks are likely to take hold um, where the blue oaks fade away. Uh, blue oaks are also at that margin. They're like a bathtub ring around the Central Valley. And so some of those areas are likely to shift into more uh, scrublands more chaparral, more, you know, less trees, fewer trees, and uh, a more um, shrubby uh, environment. All right, well, following up though on this point of limits uh, to growth, uh, to manage this environment or manage our presence in the environment, don't we have to uh, significantly and dramatically lower our impact lower our energy consumption, lower our uh, whatever, heating, plastics, uh, all the different things that make our modern civilization. These, if we're gonna have any kind of a recognizable environment, we're gonna have to reduce the impact, are we not? Or are we? Maybe we don't have to. Absolutely, I mean, this is, you know, what do we do? How do we do it? Why, hasn't, why haven't people started doing something now? What, who, who's supposed to do what? I mean, every time someone asks me the question, what can we do? I'm like, you know, act locally, regionally, statewide, globally, do everything. Oh, but, but the point is we can't yes. just keep going, no. growing at 3% GDP and using 91 million barrels of oil every day on planet earth. They think it's, you know, we have to radically shift yes. how human beings yes. show up on planet earth and if we want a kind of earth that's habitable. Is that a fair I statement? completely agree with you. And I also think it has to be, it's a multi-pronged approach because it's not just a new super powered solar, uh, you know, solar cell that's going to help us go forward into our future. It's not a, you know, just a new, a new kind of uh, set of solar panels all over the Joshua tree. I mean, climate change requires a lot of, of, change shifting in our energy and in the way we live our lives but it also requires you know you can't sacrifice biodiversity at the same time it also requires a you know having species have a seat at the table the things we care about on the planet maybe everybody doesn't care about a delta smelt or they don't care about a you know a san joaquin um, kit fox or they don't care so much about a kangaroo rat or a monarch butterfly. But the reality is, is that we are utterly dependent upon nature, absolutely and utterly dependent upon other life forms. And the more we dink around with the climate, the more we you know, think about engineering our way out of this, and the less we think about how all of those actions we have impact other species, the more in trouble we'll be and the more rapidly. So, what do we need to do? I mean, I think we need to make considerations for nature in the city. And I don't mean just planting trees. I mean, how can we foster maybe the new species of this place in the future, not just individual species, but functioning groups of species, communities of interacting birds and insects and plants? And why can't we help tend that in a more 
put ourselves back in nature. Why can't we do that? That, re that requires more, not just a change in energy source, but more attention to the actual buildings and the environment in which we live. It requires more attention to how we get our water and how we use our water. And you know, it also requires action on every level possible, better communication, better attention to what we can do in our backyard, but also who can we leverage with our national and international leaders? How can we create and foster these conversations? You were always so good at this. You were willing to have conversations, even as a governor of the state of California, with leaders all around the world, with scientists, with people who you thought, with Exxon leaders, with leaders in you know, oil and gas companies, you, you really had those hard conversations. And I think fewer and fewer people are, are doing that. And it's more and more important to do so. Well, what you're saying though, as I hear it, is that we need a radical um, reduction in our human impact. Yes. And we have to make room for other species to yes. maintain the diversity that supports life. Now, yes. Ian Wilson, speaking at a more general level, says 80% of the species that now exist, you say we've got 100% of whatever, we can only lose up to 80 if we leave half the earth undisturbed. Okay, would you agree with that? That sounds like a pretty big proposal. It's a big proposal. I mean, in California and a lot of places in the world, they're doing 30%. And I don't right. know if I'd even say 30 by 30 is that's 30% by the year 2030. It all depends on what protect really means, right? I mean, and, and what 30%? Yeah, exactly. What does protection mean? What 30% is the farmlands? You know, there's a lot of nature going on in farmlands and agricultural fields, but is it 30% of our forests? I mean, what about the deserts? I mean, there are a lot of decisions to be made there, and there's a lot of opportunity to engage at the, you know, at the local, regional, and national level too, as well as the, the, you know, around the world. But the 50% idea is really based on the idea that plants and animals, and just life in general, you gotta have a place for them to live out their lives. And when you, you know, subdivide more than, you know, the majority of Earth's surface for our use. You, whether you pave it, whether you plant it with monoculture, whether you use pesticides on it or herbicides, no matter what you do, when you use that land for human purposes and don't let nature thrive there, you've reduced the area that species have to live on the planet by that amount. And there's a very important, another important rule in life. One of the few life rules we have, I mentioned the precipitation and temperature for vegetation structure, but even more profound is that there's this thing called the species area rule. The more area you have, the more species can accumulate there, whether they evolve there in place or whether they migrate there from somewhere else. The less land you give them, the fewer species can exist. And that's what we're doing is we are taking away, you know, it's maybe not gonna happen tomorrow. It won't happen instantly because individuals can live a long time, but what they do is they start, you know, look at the, can I tell you a story about mammoths? Yeah, Our extinct yeah. mammoths. They used to be all over the Northern hemisphere and, you know, some, some you know, relatives of the mammoths were in the Southern hemisphere as well. The, the, the mammoths that made it past the, the immigration of humans into North America at the end of the Pleistocene, the beginning of the Holocene around 12,000 plus years ago, those animals that made it, the mammoths that made it, lived on little islands in the Bering Sea in the Arctic. And those animals, when you, you can look at isotopes of their bones, you can look at, you can, you know, look at their, they, they, there's some that lived, some early ones that lived in the Mediterranean too. And those that were left on islands where there's smaller areas for them to live on, they got smaller and they started stressing out their environment. They, they had poor quality water, poor quality forage. And so they showed and they started doing more inbreeding. So breeding with relatives, that gives rise to all sorts of mutations that are deleterious to survival. And so more deformities, more, you know, this is what happens with inbreeding, more recessive uh, deleterious traits or diseases. So these elephants lasted for thousands of years beyond the big megafaunal extinction, but they suffered too. And so I'm not saying that 
as we reduce, you know, right now the snapshot of our life on earth is, is already at its quote unquote equilibrium. But what we're going to see without doing, if we did nothing else in co-opting land, no other land, no other forest burnt down or cut down, no other land cleared for our agriculture, we're gonna see the demise and the erosion of biodiversity already because it takes time. Just All right. time. Yeah. So it looks like we're on the road to uh, reduce our diversity, can't yes. stop it. So yes. we're gonna have a, a more truncated world to live in. Yes. But human beings could probably survive and kill off a lot of species and still have some human, human beings walking around their plastic world. Isn't that true? I mean, not, not, a, not a pretty picture, but if you take the warming climate, if you yeah. take the uh, uh, building out uh, with more and more human impact, the species, the animals, the insects, all the diversity is gonna be squeezed and eliminated more and more. And so presumably before we get to some equilibrium, we're gonna create a radically different world that will look very different from, from where we are today. Is that a description of where we're headed? Yes. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time, my lab and I spent a lot of time thinking about poaching and charismatic megafauna because usually people listen to you when you talk about stories about tigers or elephants and they don't really care so much when you're talking about a little vole or a mouse, right? Um, or insect. So I just want to talk about insects because what's surprising right now is that it's not those rare charismatic animals that are declining. They're declining, but we do our own number on them. We go out and we hunt tigers. We, we poach elephants. Humans are pretty good at hunting every last one of those things. We are completely bamboozled by this decline in insects. The insect apocalypse came out of nowhere. And you know, the first study was done, really, there was a study done in Germany and another in Panama showing 70 to 80% of the insects have declined in just the past couple of decades. And it just, what, what happened? You know, do you think, you know, scientists have been going out and documenting all the insects in the world for years? Where are the records? We don't even have records in most places. But where we do have records and where people have been, had the insight or citizens have calculated it for whatever reason, we see these dramatic declines. And just you driving around in a truck, for example, or somebody on the highway, don't you notice a difference in the number of smashed insects on your windshield? Right, not, almost none. I, I used to have to stop. I did a lot of field work in the West and I used to have to stop almost as frequently to wipe off my windshield as I did to fill up with gas. So, and now I hardly ever clean my windshield. All right, that so, demise is terrifying. And so I would say the answer to your question is yes, we're going to go into a new world, but I think nature has some big surprises in for us. And I think we, you know, we're seeing all, there's no real good news story coming from the, the products, i.e. The, the products that we extract from the oceans or from land in terms of, you know, what we hunt and, you know, our fishing, you know, we are, there's no real good news coming there. Oh, okay, to summarize, because we, we've- Yeah, got, we're out of time already. Yeah, yeah, we are. But I want to kind of summarize the main point here. It's not just about uh, going from fossil fuel, oil, gasoline cars, to yes. solar cars, to reducing methane. Uh, climate is a big, huge problem that we have to, we have to deal with, and we are but very, very uh, lightly. But all the species, the web of life, that we're attacking, yes. that also is going to create, a, and we're on the on the road there of very destructive behavior. So yes. whether we like it or not, we if we want any tolerable future, or one we would really appreciate, we have to reduce our impact, and we have to do it in a very thoughtful way. And the we has to constitute America, China, India, Russia, Africa, Absolutely. all of it. And so the leaders, which are bogged down in nationalisms about communism and human rights and this and that, uh, this business of getting on the side of nature instead of having a war with nature is really, from what I'm hearing today, is the number one challenge that humanity faces. Is that, I, that I absolutely agree with you. We are just, you know, we're, we're heating and eating ourselves 
out of our own home. All right. I think I'm going to stop it there. Uh, I, I, I would like to get more uh, identifiable paths forward that will be more benign than the apparently super malign paths that we're on now. But that will have to be in another podcast. And uh, okay. so let me thank you. Very interesting. Governor Brown. And lots more to lots more to learn in here. Thank you so much for your time and thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you for being here. Let's okay. talk some more. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.